Nothing. No? There's something up So there's my bug there. How much did they have? 20 seconds. Check the food. This is just a stuff. Well, keep the chicken for me now. Then I'll stop it.
We ask the audience to stand, please.
Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. You believe in me, though you die, yet shall you live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall not die eternally. This is the those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not fail, but have eternal life. The hour is coming and now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and no one shall snatch them out of my hand. Because I live, you too will live. In this world, you will have tribulation. But be a good cheer, I have overcome the world. The eternal God is our dwelling place, and underneath are these everlasting arms. To thee, O Lord, I lift up my soul, O my God, in thee I trust. God, you promise to be a refuge in the sting, and a very busy heart in time of trouble. Thank you that you do not deal with us according to our sin, nor requite us according to our iniquities. If we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Almighty God and eternal Father, we come before you this morning, and we confess that these scriptures we read in the ritual of burial, when we are going through the valley of the shadow of death, It is difficult to process. For we know them and we hear them, and lately we seem to hear them so often. But we seek your help to both process and apply your word. We pray this morning for the Miller family. We pray for Brenda. As she struggles with this loss, we ask that you may come close to her, Lord. For Brian and for Amy and their families too. As the pang of death and the cold reality of the valley of the shadow of death looms large for them today, we ask God that you will make your word real for them. We confess that we don't understand what it means when you say, Blessed are they that mourn. We find it difficult, Lord, to understand that your word says, Weeping tallies for the night, and joy comes from the morning. For death is coming to the mother family as a rude interruption. And were they to express the desire to you this morning, they would have Brian, they would have Taylor around still, God. They would have him healthy and well. But God, your ways are not our ways, and your thoughts are not ours. We are so limited in our perspective. You are both Alpha and Omega. You know the beginning from the end. And so, Obi, look. And with difficulty, we entrust ourselves to you this morning. And ask God that you be the God of comfort, that you make real your word, that you who have not gone back on any of your promises will come again, and in the midst of the Miller family, his siblings, and his children and grandchildren, may the God of peace, the God of comfort, the God who said, cast your cares upon me, for I care for you, that you will come and make those promises to me. We ask this in the name of your Son, our Savior, who thanks to you. Amen.
yang tidurnya di situ. Platform this morning to the soul come back to church. I need to see this dollars and I want to pass this year to church and I want to convey the condolences of our pastor, Milton Seal, and his wife, Jackie, who we are also engaged in a family funeral this morning. They have been with us on behalf of the leadership of this church and our largest soul fund community, Linda, Ryan, and the family. We express our condolences. No matter how much we anticipate this and the signs or evidence that life is getting away, when it happens, it's always painful. And so we pray that God will draw close to you. The blind sibling is present here today, and the God of peace be with you. Folks, we gather under difficult circumstances, and I want to ask just a few housekeeping things. Uh, that you will notice that we mark off every second few just in terms of wanting to be compliant with the alert table three protocol. And there are X's marked on each of the benches when you can sit. If it's not your immediate family when you with every day, then please be put this check sitting where those X's are marked or signed on the benches. And also, just out of respect, let's put off all the cell phones, let's focus in these moments as we support the Miller family. Bullets are out on my right, and uh, you welcome. They also um, operate and sanitize at the doors, so please, if you need to go, those are they do. Thank you, by the Miller Ford, so you sing a song of worship to us. Let's listen to the Miller Ford to the song.
and all the changes that were to follow, which became harder as time went on and the dimension of rapidly accelerated. A highlight of Trevor was spending the New Year's holiday in January 2019 with his family as Haley, Vito, and India came from France and Brian, Erin, Judah, and Israel came from Johannesburg. They were all able to spend quality time together at the house they hired in Jerusalem, which would be the last time together as a family. By June of the same year, Trevor was ill and was admitted to Victoria Hospital on the 12th of June 2019, and from there he went to Booth Hospital. After he was clear that he would need more care than Brenda could manage, he went into the Hazel Walk Dementia Unit. The staff in the Dementia Unit knew exactly how to look after him, and Brenda was comforted that he was in the best possible care. On the 3rd of June this year, he had a fall and captured his head. Privacy Hospital did not want to operate because of his diabetes and his frail condition. And once he was made comfortable, they sent him back to his report. He had to go into the sick bay in isolation where he spent his 69th birthday on the years of the year. It was a sadness of Brenda that because of the lockdown and the COVID virus risk, she was not allowed to visit him. But she phoned constantly to check how he was doing. A few days after returning to Lukov, when he seemed he might be improving, he passed away early on Saturday, the 20th of June. Fortunately, with one of his favorite carers, Nurse Sonia, at his bedside. Brenda will always be grateful for the amazing compassion which the staff at Lukov showed towards Trevor, whom they described as a gentleman even though he would be quite a tough patient. Rest in peace, Trevor, free of your pain and suffering. I have a, a um, message to read uh, from Hayley, who sent it uh, from France. Uh, she's watching the live stream right now. So I get to read what she sent to me. For Dad. The last time we spoke, was about a month ago. I called the place where you were staying. I was so desperate to hear your voice. You didn't say much, and I couldn't say much because I did not want you to be disorientated. I knew, though, that you felt me, and I felt your presence. I could hear you crying, and I had to make sure you didn't hear me doing the same thing. How am I supposed to say goodbye to a part of myself? This is just so surreal, having to be so far away. I'm sorry for things said or unsaid, things that were done or not done. I'm just grateful that my daughter and partner got to meet you a year ago, and you and I are two of the same coin, a relationship very intense. You were and always will be my number one man. One thing that we had between us was our love for music. I remember those Saturday and Sunday mornings you sitting in the lounge with the music blaring out of the sound system at 8 a.m. I will cherish the memories we made together, all of them. There are so many, I can't share all of them right now. It is time to rest, to not worry anymore. We cannot be separated by physical death because you are a part of all of us. You live on me, all of us. Your spirit is free, and I'm looking forward to seeing where you are now. It might be in a song that I hear, or a smile on someone's face. Thank you for everything, everything. I always have and always will love you, from Haiti. Thank you, Joy. I would like to keep with which you share the window in the life of Trevor Miller. It's sad that in the conclusion, our lives are in this I'm reminded of the words of the song, it's a 
Glad to have seen this. I was in the morning. My father passed away. He needed to tell him all the things I have seen. Sometimes all we have is comfortable books of paper and still the conversations. I'm afraid it's all we have says the song. But thank you, baby, for sharing even your heart with the family. We do ask the audience stand. We haven't got this as a song of the program. We tell them sometimes not to see it, stand us. These are such human moments. These are such intense moments. Let's stand and sing and remind ourselves that because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. While Jack, Mahoney, and Abel Barnes prepare themselves to come and share with us their dreams. You know the song, let's sing it out. I'm not going to be singing it out, but let's sing it. Closer at that time. And so I passed sort of, you know, split at that time. That was my first meeting with Trevor. I called it the first installment. And then come up the second installment was when Trevor moved to Graha. And then eventually joined Johnson Wax. And we got to know each other very, very, very closely. We were great family friends. Our kids were in and out of their house, like little brothers and sisters, at parties or weekends or Sunday mornings. I would drive down to Trevor at times of the church, and he would boast about his uh, little herb garden. And of course, he's standing in the kitchen, you know, cooking. And uh, they're coming to the kitchen, he won't allow him there while he's busy cooking. 
and others who say, but this is not your place. He said, this is mind your own business. Eh? And Trevor spoke it like that, spoke uh, to the team. And so we would meet each other, and then we would go on camps as a family, along with Clyde and Claude and, and all those guys. We'd go up to Mossel Bay, to George, Nice, Buckelsdorf, even up to Durban. And uh, we got to bond and know each other even closer then. But one thing, Trevor, when we go on these journeys, and our kids were still really small. And Jack Mahoney, when he gets into a car, that's when his holiday starts. He wants to see the views around, he wants to see everything. Trevor, when we stop, he says, are you? I wanted to use the words that he was saying. Right? You know, Trevor, how can you just stop every time you see a garage? I said, my kids have got to be pampered and they've got to be looked after, you know? No, 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 no. If Trevor could drive from Cape Town to Durban nonstop, he would have done that. So that was Trevor. And then, Trevor being a mechanic, you know, one thing stood out to me, I've never seen a bonnet open at Trevor's house ever. <laughs> Unlike all mechanics, and I used to tell him, I ah, do operate. Listen, just mind your own business, okay? And that, and uh, when we go on tours also, or camps and long drives, he said, please guys, make sure your cars are okay, because I'm not opening up any booths here. And so that was Trevor. And uh, when we went on these camps, you know, Trevor was the breakfast man and the bride man. And when he was at breakfast, none of the women at some camp there or the wives were able to come into the kitchen. That was my kitchen and I came on that kitchen until after breakfast. Lunch is yours and rice is ours again. So that was Trevor. Um, at one incident, you know, uh, Trevor obviously never liked the seawater. Some incident in that probably is a baby, I don't know all the details. And he would not dare go close to a swimming pool. And so it was surprising to me. On the day they loaded their pool out there in Kingdom, and the fire uh, department was there to put a pipe over the wall to fill the pool. And I said, Trevor, you built this pool. What pool? You're going to swim. He said, What do you mean? Then the pool was really halfway by the time I got there. He said, what do you think? I'm the first person to go into the deep end here and I'll brag that for the rest of my life. But I won't tell you, it was when the water was ankle deep. <laughs> so he would boast, he said, don't ever remind me that I can't swim. I was in the deep end of my pool. And um, so we had some wonderful, wonderful stories with Trevor. And uh, it was all part of sort of the second installment Wonderful family time. My son put this on here to on the blender and redeem my parents to work with Trevor. What an amazing thing of it all. We all used to be so often at each other's homes and camping together and going away on holidays. Fond memories were the passing of Uncle Clive and Uncle Trevor and others. Some of the greats have left us mere mortals behind. May you rest in peace, may God bless on the Brenda and family during this time. And that's how I keep you clever. And I come into the third installment with my journey uh, at the Ark. Trevor was with Johnson Wax, and we hadn't seen each other probably for a year and a half. And he rocked up there one day, and I was busy writing a letter to him and uh, to ask him to see what he can do to help us. But he arrived there. And from that day one that he arrived, he blessed his charitable heart, reached out to the heart, gave us cleaning equipment and cleaning detergents, etc. Right up to the, almost to the point of his retirement, even when he opened up his own company, he was still calling faithfully once a week or twice a week, they were us donating stuff, some of the stuff we would buy. So it started with the floor with Jackson Wax, Johnson Wax. And it ended up with the floor. Our school opened it two weeks ago. We've got the most shiny of floors, wooden floors, that you can escape to walk on there. And that was a legacy that Trevor left behind at our school. It was a legacy of his professionalism, of his, of his perfection, that he wanted to see everything go according to the best standards. So when I look at that floor, Brenda and Brian and the others, I'm going to always remember Trevor for the rest of my life. Amongst all the other uh, all the other attributes that he displayed during his life as a friend. He was a great friend of mine, great rugby friend. He hated cricket, which I hated him for. Because cricket is my first love. 
I will never sit there all day and sit there and guys walk up and down, up and down. No, no. Rugby was his number one in sport that he used to watch. But cricket is here. Come on, cricket is your real life, but not for me. So, Brenda and Brian, I want to say to you, uh, thank you for, for what you've been to us as a family as well. And these two boys sitting there, it, just to end off, I must tell you, the times I went to Johannesburg to visit Andre when they were tiny and they were growing up in church and I met this, and I would come back with pictures, and I said, Trevor, I've got some pictures of the boys. He would fly out there to come and see and just to print out some pictures of the two boys. So my condolences to you guys as well. And uh, may soul rest in peace. It's not going to be easy, it's going to be tough, Brenda, but God's strength and comfort to you all in the days and the years ahead. Amen. Good morning. Uh, Brian and Amy, you don't know the cares that you've caused in heaven today. Because Trevor will be so proud to know that his funeral is being televised around the world, <laughs> that every corridor in heaven knows about it. He would be so proud and he would be telling everybody what these two kids did for him. At his funeral. He's sitting around at the, the high table in heaven with Pops, with Dennis, with Claude, and telling them what you have done for him today at his funeral. You will be so proud. And in the last couple of years, two or three years, he probably told me four times in every 30 minutes how proud he is of Hayden and Brian and what they are doing. He wouldn't remember the previous occasion, so he told me again, just to make sure that I remember. And I guarantee you that you'd, be, you'd send me a message today to cut the DVDs of this funeral to give it to everybody. And you all know that Trevor wasn't technically uh, at Bath. He was technically child. And I'm telling you, similarly, now, he would call me all the way to Miami and say, listen, when are you coming home? I'd say, I'm coming home soon, what? I pressed the button on the thing, and now the TV won't go. I guarantee you, I said, the TV is cheaper than some of them. He would not have liked, and he's certainly not impressed with the time of his death at the moment, during this corona time. And then you know, okay, he told the very clear that at his funeral, he wants all the boys there and he wants to have a huge foster party. And so in these times, so again, when these times are done, we will have that after party. Because for him, family and friends, was a big thing. He could hear from God. Family and friends for him was a big thing. And when he will tell you, he was as funny on his one liners as you can imagine. So just a couple of quick one liners. Okay? There is nothing like this one. But through pure desperation and frustration, because he's over the last year or two, he used to call. He said, ask, where's Brenda? Where's Brenda? I said, it's not safe with him already. How you know, many times you asked, where's Brenda? And Brenda was right there. And at one stage, through frustration, Brenda said, I'm Brenda, I'm here. He looked at her and he said, you wish. <laughs> and I guarantee you, he's exactly the funny side he was saying about it. Suddenly, the story goes that he was a neurosurgeon doing a test. And they were asking him questions. Just a sec. One of the questions was, who's the president of South Africa? He looked at the neurosurgeon, said nothing. Eventually, the neurosurgeon prompted him by saying, is it not Cyril? 
Trevor looked back at him and said, you might be on first name terms with him. <laughs> Again, he knows exactly what he was saying, don't worry. And one by one, he said, when I was having your visit in a flu cough, he had a male nurse there. And when I came in, he never said to me, no, this guy's very good, make sure you buy him a beer. I said, okay, no problem. The guy was not halfway out of the door when he turned around and he said, forget him, you keep the beer. <laughs> Where there was his work, his business, all the projects he did at St. John's Football Club, he always made sure he did well and was proud of what he achieved. And we used to sit for hours and he would tell me what he did at St. John's or at work. And so I think the best tribute for Trevor is to understand what God teaches us through these, these events. That we all agree that he was taken away before his time at 69. And that changes in our lives happen fast and without us knowing. There's no email, there's no message, there's no phone call. We cannot control, we cannot slow it down. And so I think that's the message that Trevor leaves with us and that God teaches us today through his life. That everything we do Everything we say, everything that we plan for, needs to be done through Him. Because we have no control on that. And so, Trevor, we are finally going back to Fox. Because for the last year and a half, you ask me every day, how he pops, and when, he, when, he, when are you going to see him again? So today, you are sitting around the high table with Pop, Uncle Sir, Dennis, the Romeo, and all the angels before you, reminiscing about life, what you guys did, what you guys didn't do, and what everybody else should be doing. And for me, that is a tribute to Trevor. Thank you, Admiral and Jack, for sharing with us. I, I didn't know Trevor, but I must say I'm envious as I listen to the anecdotes about his life. Clearly, a person who had an infectious personality one who had the capacity to draw people to him. And so, thank you for contributing to the grieving process by sharing those choice anecdotes. In the, I think of those, that statement he made, that one line, if anything he speaks about what he really thought of you. We get to invite to the podium now uh, Cheryl Fantil as she comes to do the scripture reading for us. Cheryl, will you come? Amen. 
makes me lie down. Even if you have stepped in the air, you need to have this more water. It refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths. For his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of darkness, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your God, and your soul. You prepare the table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Jehovah, until we meet again, my brother. Thank you, Sheila. Let's bow to as we pray and commend Brian to the Lord as he comes to share God's word with us. Let's bow to as we pray. Father, of whom can we seek succor but of thee? We come to you now in the name of Jesus and ask that you would open our hearts and our minds and that you prepare them to hear and receive your word. Grant that your word will fall on ground that is prepared and ready to germinate. We pray for your servant, Lord, as he comes to deliver your message at this difficult time personally to you. We pray that you may unction him, that you may anoint him, that you may give him a capacity beyond his natural self. That he may speak the word with boldness and confidence. That he may speak the word because it is your word. Hiding behind the cross. Remove from this platform anything that speaks from you of human achievement. And cause that the name of the Lord will be lifted up. For you said alone, if you be lifted, will you draw all men unto yourself. We pray now for Brian, that you will touch him, touch his lips, Lord, as we commit him to you in Jesus' name. Thank you, Brian. Just in terms of honoring you, anyone who's really sick, in terms of those of us who've been behind, I'm just so grateful to God that allowed my relationship with my dad to be restored. Yeah, a relationship that I need to look possible. So as a shield and sword, I'm going to say it's like just like my dad. But I pray that we will really just minister to you today. And that God will really speak to you. Through the words that I share with you. Because the reality is that even as I said in the list, I am fruit from his words. I'm the next generation. I know what he's left behind for all of us. You know, for those of you now, we think that it's just about us for now, but soon the time is going to change. When you have to start your own family, you have to hold your life. The next generation is the only one that you have. You know, to leave behind what God has placed in you. It's only to affect others. 
with the life that you have in this earth. It actually gives a safety beyond you. You see, there's a level of success that you can reach in life. But that's only when you have things. The time you shift into significance is when you affect other people's lives. And so that's what I was thinking. I know many people, if there wasn't this pandemic, this person would be full today. Because my daddy had an effect on many people's lives. He was just that kind of person. He had that kind of personality that a lot of kids know. He was cooked his mom, he had the gift of the gap. And those are many of the things that we even shared with the economies that we have in our day. But today I just want to, I want to minister on the dash. Because, you know, when you, when you see a tombstone, even in the deep, it's not sure if it's on this deep, but I need to put the mic close to it. Okay, cool. Is that better? Yeah. Um, there's a dash that gives you your date of birth and the date that you left this earth, and there's a dash in the earth. And that little dash represents the life that you live here on this earth. As small as it is, I think it's so significant in actually what it conveys to us. Because sometimes we think we're going to live forever. We think things are going to last forever. We think family is going to be with us forever. And so sometimes we even notch along in our lives and in the way that we deal with things. But the reality is you only got just such a little life. You know, the Bible says in James chapter 4, verse 4 to 14, it says, You do not know, this is the fact, yet you do not know the least thing about what may happen tomorrow. Or what is the nature of your life? Listen to this. It says, You are really but a wisp. A vapor, a puff of smoke, a mist that is visible for a little while and then disappears. He's relating the light that we have now in relation to eternity. He says, uh, many of us have done before, you know, when we were, were younger. We, when you come up and it's cold, it's winter now, we blow a little bit of smoke, and someone's even like that. We smoke it when we are younger. But it's a little bit of smoke, as quick as you blow it out and as quick as it's gone, that's how it relates to the time that you have in this world. And you have that short little space, that little dash, that spirit. You know, we say three life is a marathon, and yes, because God is closest to change, but <laughs> in terms of eternity, it's actually a spirit. It's so quick, and then it's gone. And you've got a short space of time, here we go. You've got a short space of time to make an impact and to affect the next generation with the time that you've been allotted here. So in terms of the dash, I want to deal with two things. There's two key decisions that you have to make, that you have to determine for your life here on earth. And the first decision is based upon what you're going to do with God's sight. That's number one. Because if you don't answer number one, you cannot even go to number two. What are you going to do with God's sight? John chapter 40, verse 16, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except there is no other way there is no other way there is no one that came to stand as a mediator before to stand and bridge the gap between us and God the Father and hear me I'm not talking about some religious exercise I'm not talking about church attendance I'm not talking about you know where you can tick on the form when you fill out the form what are you what religion are you tick Christian I'm not talking about that because you can have a life that looks good but has no power to change anything the Bible calls it the form of godliness with no power. The Bible speaks of it and says you can have religious activity. Jesus says your traditions are making the word of God of no effect. So for us in our generation, there is such an urgency even in my life personally and where I am right now to do what God wants us to do. Why? Because you've got such a short space of time to make an impact. So that's the starting point. It's the decision. What do you do with God's son? Because, hear me, if you, if you take it into the context of what Jesus came to do. Jesus didn't come to give us a church building. That was not his intention. We gather. But his intention was never to have a church building. He came to restore, to redeem mankind. And when you go back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, it says, uh, God said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. And let them have dominion. When God started us in the beginning, it wasn't a church that he had an intention of building, but a family, an extended family that he would have in the earth. So when God says, let us make man in our image and in our likeness, he deals with image is exact duplicate of kind. It means I'm making one like me. 
in the earth. That's the, the, the interpretation of the Hebrews. It's an exact duplicate of time. And then likeness deals with your ability to function and be like God. That's why, you know, when you see your children say, hey, that is your pastor, turn you. You know what I'm saying? There's certain things, even when you're sharing here, yeah, we can laugh about because I do the same thing. Don't go on a road trip with me. Estrever Miller straight there. We're not stopping. We're stopping by this garage where I'm telling you we're stopping. So you better keep it in until we get there. Because you're on a mission. And my children know. But it's what? Yeah, it's your passing because you carry traits down. Are you with me? So the same is when God made man in the beginning, he made us to look like him, to be the exact duplicate of kind, and to have the ability to function like him. Unfortunately, Adam messes up in Genesis chapter 3, and the Bible says that he, Jesus God says, I'm going to send another seed. I'm going to send a solution to what you did, because when Adam sinned, he separated himself from God. He chose to devoid himself from the relationship, the family relationship, the ability to call him father. He separated himself from them when he made the decision in Genesis chapter 3. But God sends a solution in his son, Jesus Christ. Hear me. When Adam allows son to enter in, he is then fathered by son. But sin takes the seed of mankind, meaning that we can never look like God ever again until there's an intervention. So when Jesus comes onto the scene, and Jesus comes to bring salvation to us, it's not just a thing of saying, I'm a Christian, I can go to church. It is stored the relationship with God the Father. It is stored, you hear me, when I heard this message and this thing sunk into my heart, you know, me and my dad, we had issues. <laughs> We had issues. And we were both to blame. But you know, when God touched my heart and revealed this to me, it changed my life for him. Because without anybody doing anything, without my father saying a word to me, I could go to him and say, you know what, daddy, I love you. And 13 years ago, we had a conversation and God started to restore our relationship. Why? Because I had a relationship with God the Father. And there wouldn't be a moment where we would put down the phone and not tell each other that we love each other. From never ever saying yeah, to a place of where we could not put down the phone without telling each other that we love each other. And it was a deep, sincere love that I have for my dad. But it's because of what God did for me. And he says in Ephesians chapter 2, it's just going to be with me this morning. Ephesians chapter 2, Verse 18, and it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not your works. This any man should boast. He says that by grace you have been saved. There's nothing that you can do to be saved. There's nothing that you can do to reconnect you back to God. Hear me. The only thing is that you can appropriate the works of Christ through faith. So when he says by grace, grace brought the solution. That even in my mess, and even in who I was, God still loved me. But there was nothing that I could do to make him Make, you understand what I'm saying? There's nothing I could do that could qualify me before you. The Bible says your, your, your good deeds are as filthy rags. So there's nothing, it's no church attendance that makes it right. <laughs> there's, no, there's no religious activity that makes it right. It's only the work of the cross. It's only what Jesus Christ, you see, when he accepted all our sins, past, present, and future. He said, I'm taking sin. I'm taking in this body that is perfect. And I'm going to sacrifice, I'm going to pay for the wage of sin, which is death. The requirement for sin was death. He says, I'm going to pay for it through my body. And when he does that, he says, okay, now you can receive the new life that comes from me. And this is where it gets really powerful. In 1 Peter 1, verse 23, it says, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. He says, when you get born again, because remember, when Adam sinned, the seed got tainted. And one which could produce another mini G God in the earth now lost that ability because the seed that it transposed was a seed that was not like God. But when you get born again, the Bible says you're born again of the incorruptible. That means it cannot be messed up, seed of the word of God. It cannot be missed. It cannot be tainted. And when it says the word of God, John chapter 1 verse 1 says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God, which means the word and God are synonymous. So he says you're born again of the incorruptible seed of the word of God. He's actually saying you're born again of the incorruptible seed of God himself. So he could restore you back to Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 where he says, now you're born again in my image and in my likeness. And this is the first decision that every person here on this earth, we need to make in the little space that you have. 
is what did you do with God's son? You know, I had the peace because I spoke to my father about this. I had a chat with my daddy about Jesus. And Trevor told me in his own way. <laughs> I said, Pops, because I had the privilege of my daddy seeing me minister, seeing me preach a couple of times. I'm so honored, man, what God did for me. I'm so blessed with him. that I had my time with my daddy. But I said to him, I said, Dad, Pops, I said, hey, I said, so tell me, man, you believe in Jesus? He looked at me almost like so puzzled and confused. Of course, I always have. I was like, okay, cool. The conversation ends here. Yeah. <laughs> but my daddy was straight. And that day, inside of me, the Holy Spirit just gave me peace. You see, because at the cross, it doesn't matter your degree. It doesn't matter the money you have. Nothing matters but Jesus. Because the only problem we all have together when you're born into this earth is sin. You're born with a nature of sin. And it's only through being born from a new seed that your life can change forever. Because now I have the ability to respond to that seed of God inside of me when I deal with whatever I'm dealing with. That's what the Bible says. We don't mourn like the rest of the world. Why? Because I know where I'm going to see my father. I know he's with the king in heaven. It's sad for me that I'm separated from him today, but I know that when the time comes, I'm going to see him. Amen? So the number one place, the first place to start is what did you do with Jesus? Not did you go to church. What did you do with him? Did you receive the finished work? Did you receive the new seed so that you can live the new life? And only if you answer this one correctly can you shift to the next. And the next is what did you do with God's will, purpose, or plan for your life? Because each and every person, you hear for a purpose and a plan. Hear me. My father's legacy will live on through me and through my sister. My father's legacy, what his impact can only be seen through our lives. And he's done much. Hear me. I learned a lot from my daddy. There's a lot of traits that I learned from my father. Punctuality. Daddy don't like being like. Excellence. He was always a man of excellence. Sometimes to perfection. I see it a lot in my one son. <laughs> Nothing can be out of place. Hard work, diligent, loyal. That was my dad. And those things I received from him, but they now become the beginning point of my life. I can't end with the same story my daddy had. I've got to take the baton from him and run the race that God has given me. That's what the Bible says, run your race. Run your dash. You only got a short period of time. You think it's going to last forever, but moments like this remind us that it's not. And everybody has a purpose. You know I mean? There's not one person on here. There's not God or day that God had not set in place for you to be on the earth. In Psalms 139, verse 13 to 9, it says, You formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. This is before you've been born. He says, I will praise you, David, speaking to God, for I am fearfully, wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and my soul knows that well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. And in your book, they all were written. The days Fashion for me, when as yet there was none of them. Jeremiah 1 verse 5 says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you, and I ordained you as a prophet to the nations. Here he's saying that before you were even born, while you were being formed in your mother's womb, God already had a relationship with you. God already knew you. He knew who you were. He knew what he designed you to be. He already set you in place. And in Jeremiah, he says, in, in, in Psalms, he says, I wrote out every day of your life. Everyone. I wrote it out why I scripted a plan and a purpose for you, specifically for you and not for anybody else. Jeremiah says, I ordained you. How do you ordain somebody who's not born? He already set it in place that this is going to be the purpose of your life. And so that's the second. What are you going to do with God's purpose and plan for your life? You've got a limited amount of time to do what God needs you to do. And not everybody's called to the pulpit. That's not the message. The message are we showing the world what it's supposed to look like when you live for Jesus. Because for 90% of us, I can guarantee you now, and I'm not saying this in any way, even myself included, we're not. Not really portraying the life that God wants us to portray. 
Acts chapter 17, verse 26, he says, And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth and has determined the pre-appointed times and boundaries of their dwellings. Pre-appointed times, God's given you your dash. He's allotted your time for the specific purpose and destiny that God has assigned for you. And your boundaries and your borders is the place that you were even born to. You were born through your parents. But God knew that what was inside of you was more than enough to deal with what you're facing in your life. And so this is why I want to say this to you today. We don't have much time on this earth. You know? We have decisions that we need to make that is going to allow us to affect the next generation like never before. You see the problem that you're seeing in society. And the reason why I'm even sharing this with both is because even my daddy, like Uncle Jock said, he was a philanthropist. Even he's got a signed book, something that I asked my mom that I can have from Nelson Mandela as the noted philanthropist. And the reason why I say it's because he had a heart for people. He had a heart to help. Are you with me? And some of those people will know him that I don't even know. That's the effect of how his far his legacy can go. But I, I have to take up the better now and say, I'm going to take it further than what it's been before. And hear me for each and every one of you sitting under the sound of my voice today. I'm sharing this message with you because I want you to understand that there's an urgency for all of us. You see what's happening out in the streets? The mess that's happening in communities? Don't think it's far away from your household or from your home. It's not a doom and gloom message. This is just to say to you that we have the ability to make the change we want to see. It starts with us. The decision starts with you. The first decision concerning God. And the second concerning the purpose and the plan for you, for your life. It's imperative that in this moment and in this season and in this time, that we wake up to what God wants to do. To the generation that's gone before us, it's not too late to change it. It's not too late to change it. It's not too late to fix what needs to be fixed. You still have an opportunity. For those that's coming up, don't think that you know it all, because you don't. You need the next generation to help you, to pull you to where you need to be. Are you with me? But there's stuff inside of you, your gifts, your talents, your God-given purpose that you must start to think about and focus on from today. You see, so many times we want to blame the generation that's gone before us. We want to, we want to sit victim. We want to sit in the victim seat to what's transpired and what's happened against us. But today you can make a different decision. You know, I'm reminded of a story. I was just thinking of my dad. I had a rough night last night. But I was just thinking of my dad, and there was one night where um, me and my friends were out and uh, in town and catching on nonsense. And uh, we did something wrong and got beaten up heavily by the bouncers. And I called my dad. And my, this is 2 o'clock in the morning. My strategy is I'm going to call my pops, tell the people my lawyer's coming, when he rocks up here, they're all going to think they're in trouble. I'm going to deal with it from there. But I forgot this is Trevor we're talking about. Pops rocks up there. Didn't go down the way I thought it was going to go down. And eventually, he just said, listen here, you do what you want to do, but I'm out. And if I look back now, I mean, I was so angry with my daddy today. But when I look back now, there's no uh, parent in their right mind would have done what either son wanted to have done anyway. And God just reminded me something. So probably said, you know what? He came out of everything. At two o'clock in the morning when I phoned my pops, he was wanting to get out of bed and to come and see. And so, so many times we're looking for, even I'm speaking to the younger people, you're looking for your parents to get it 100%. Looking at them to fix certain things for your life. But the reality is at least for many of you and for many of us, we have a better situation than most people. It's time to fix that thing even in your hearts, to forgive those that you need to forgive, to restore relationships that you need to restore. Even to the older generation, make right what you need to make right. Don't be too proud in a moment like this. Let's not sit in a situation where we don't do the things that we need to do because tomorrow's not, if you see that, it says you don't even know how quick it is. And once you've made those things, then run the race that God has got for you. Hear me, you all, each and every one of us, we designed to leave a legacy behind. And legacy is only through people, not things. It's for us to leave what God is depositing in our lives in the next generation. 
And I, I like I say, I love my daddy. My, my daddy could only give me what he had. I know more now concerning my relationship with God and what he did in his time. But it's not for me to judge him. It's for me to take that and run further so that my children, when they're sharing the testimony one day of my impact in their lives, it must be beyond where my daddy gave me the baton to run. Amen. I pray that this message has really hit home to some of you, to all of you, and that God will really minister to you even beyond this point. It feels so weird in this place that everybody's so spaced out. But I just want to give an opportunity with every head bowed and your eye closed. Just bow your heads and close your eyes. I just want to give you the opportunity. Right now, I'm going to pray a simple prayer. And if this word is ministered to your heart, and you know that you need to make right in your relationship with Jesus, in your relationship with God. If you know in your heart, you know you've never ever fully committed your life to God, or you did, but you know that where you are today is not where you're supposed to be, then let's get the first thing right and set it in place this morning. I'm going to pray this prayer. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. I want everybody to pray with me. But for those that really believe in their hearts that this is the day that they need to make a change, that they need to make an adjustment, that the Spirit of God is speaking to you, then just say this prayer through faith. And the Bible says that you shall be saved, born in you, and made in His image and in His likeness. Let's pray that prayer. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, I believe with all my heart that you are the Son of God, that you came down from heaven, died on the cross for the forgiveness of my son, rose again three days later, that I may have life. Jesus, come into my heart, wash me, cleanse me of all sin, make me brand new. I thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Thank you for those that pray that prayer sincerely. Thank you for the privilege and the honor for me to lead you in that prayer this morning. But I believe with all my heart, yeah, me for each and every person sitting here, we all know each other because we have relations with each other. We're family. I urge you today. I urge you, I implore you today. Make the decisions that you need to make to make the time that you have here of the utmost value that you ever have. Reach out to those that you need to reach out to. Make right with those that you need to make right with. And it's not about them saying sorry. It's about you knowing what's right for you. It's about you receiving that love of God that makes it impossible for you to love another. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Brian, for such courage and for so lucidly just letting us know again what it means to be in a right relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said in John 3, Verily, verily, I say unto you, unless a man is born again, he shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. We're going to uh, spend some time just watching a video tribute, after which Brenda will prepare herself for the vote of thanks after which we'll do the committal.
Morning to all the colleagues. Thanks for attending. I just want to say a huge thank you to the many family members, friends, and total strangers for all the prayers, practical help, and caring during Trevor's illness. To Harold, Denise, and Cheryl, thanks for all the get together. Trevor enjoyed it so much and always look forward to seeing you all. Clive and Priscilla, Although time and distance separates us, you are always just a phone call away, and I value so much your support. Thank you to my siblings and their partners for always being ready to help. God has truly blessed me with an amazing family. To my sister Joy, thanks so much. You were always there for us, no matter what, and I would not swap you for all the money in the world. Maybe a million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> to the total stranger who stopped, to the total stranger who stopped to pick Trevor up when he was sitting on the sidewalk about a kilometer away from home, lost and confused, you took him to your home, gave him coffee in the biscuit, and waited for me to come from work to fetch him. I later found out that this was the grandson of my mom's best friend who did not know Trevor from a bar so Lindsay, thank you for dropping everything and coming to my house when I needed you. I really appreciate appreciated your advice. Dr. Rodney Esso, for seeing Trevor at the house at a moment's notice. Doctors don't do our schools anymore, but you did this for him. There are so many angels out there, and I don't mean with him. Far too many to mention who helped you with Trevor. To the family members and friends, you know who you are, who I would just phone and say, I need to go to a meeting and you would fetch Trevor for an hour or two to give me a break. To the nurses and carers at Hate Lupo, words cannot explain how much I appreciate all of the care and love you showered on Trevor. I was truly blessed to find the perfect place for him when I could no longer look after him. And I know he was happy there because he never ever told me to take him home. He used to tell me he was staying in a five-star hotel. <laughs> to his will, and, um, and then I'd also like to say thank you to Darren for organizing the live stream so that those that can't be here with us are able to be um, that they can participate in the ceremony. Mm -hmm. To the people say thank you so much. To his well undertakers, Dominic, it felt so good to hand it over to you and know that you will do everything that was needed. Those words, Auntie Brenda, sit back and relax, means the world to me. To the Soul Town Baptist Church, thanks for allowing us to use your church for the service. And to Pastor Edgar for stepping in so to help Brian. Brian, thank you for doing your dad's service. You were so proud of you being a pastor. Amy, I am sad that you cannot be with us today, and I miss you very much. And then, thank you, God, 
through all of us. I always saw the daily man guiding me in my pain and confusion. Lastly, Trevor would be proud to say that he's not having an after party today. He used to tell me when I die, I don't want the tea in the hall, the people must come to my house. Unfortunately, we cannot have a day together because of the restrictions. But as you leave the church, please take a packet of donuts to enjoy with your coffee when you get home. Thanks for attending. <laughs> I have to do something. <laughs> Thank you, Brenda. I'm sure Brian and your daughter would want to say to you, Haley would want to say to you, thank you, mom, for all you meant to dad, for the way in which you cared for him, and for the way in which you showed them what it means to, for better, for worse, for richer or poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherry, till death do us part. Well done, Brenda. Let's give her a hand. We're going to stand as we do the committal now. Uh, it's a cremation, a private cremation. So we're going to do the committal here in the church, after which we're going to uh, have the pallbearers come and we're going to take the coffin out. And then outside, we'll just form a guard of honor as we bid Trevor farewell. That's okay. So let's stand as we listen to the word of the Lord. The Bible says, as a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. For he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. The Lord is good to all and his compassion is over all that he has made. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the God of mercy, and the God of all comfort who comforts us in all of our affliction. To this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. We know that if the earthly house of our tabernacle be dissolved, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Much of the funeral service focuses on the person who's passed. And then often the sermon reminds us that funerals are more about the living than what they are about the dead. And I think Brian did well to challenge us this morning to remind us that the only lasting thing that takes us beyond the threshold of this life is a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. I think he was very lucid and I don't think any of us can leave this place in any doubt that that is absolutely necessary. But we also live our lives in community. We live our lives amongst each other. And I think the note of Brenda's thanks just emphasize that again, that we live our lives in community. We live our lives amongst each other. And the best gift we have is the gift of friendship and love and compassion. And so were we to be at the graveside today, I would remind the family that if we scan the scope of any graveyard, we will quickly see that death is no respecter of person. That dash with Brian referred to, for some, seems a little bit longer. For others, it's not even an ink spot. We don't know when it will happen to us. And I think the fact that we don't know means that we must make the best of the moment. Therefore, live life to the fullest. Give uncertainty. Live your life so that what you leave behind is a legacy of kindness, 
and authentic. And so often at funerals, we get to see people we haven't seen for a while because our eyes are so busy. And so my challenge is you may see someone that you've not seen for a while. It's the time to go across and just renew the bond of friendship and love. But also, as in every family and every community, there are times when our relationships are a bit dislocated, when we have misunderstanding, when we said what we should not have said, when we kept quiet when we should have said something and somebody's not happy about it. It's the time to set those things right. To live at peace. To know that when God comes for you and me, we don't go with bad news. We go naked into the world we came, naked to the world. So my challenge is at the ongoing of Jehovah, that you make sure, I make sure, that those in my relationship are in place. Amen? Amen. Well, as much as it is pleased for Almighty God to receive unto himself the body of our dearly departed brother, Sheva, we commit him now to be consumed, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, in the sure and certain hope of the resurrection, knowing that God is able to transform his earthly body, that it might be like unto the heavenly body which he has prepared for him. We are reminded of the words of John 14, Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. To my father's house so many rooms. Listen, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come back and fetch you, so that you will maybe with me. Thomas said to him, Father, how can we know where you're going? We don't know the way. He said, as Brian reminded us, I am the way the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Into your hands now we commit, clever Lord. We release him, knowing that he is in a better place, free from all that mind and body held in captive, now free, where there's no more tears and there's no more crying. For the mother family, May the circle be unbroken. In Jesus' name. Amen. We need to invite the four wheels forward up the church. So the Gail Daniels, Evel Bond, Jill from the Kew. Jason Barnes and Denzel Miller, if you come up with.
Thank you.